My name is Matthew Todd and welcome to Inside the Scale Up. This is the podcast for founders and executives in tech looking to make an impact and learn from their peers within the tech business. We lift the lid on tech businesses, interviewing leaders and following their journey from startup to scale up and beyond, covering everything from developing product market fit, funding and fundraising models to value proposition structure and growth marketing. We learn from their journey so that you can understand how they really work, the failures, the success, the lessons along the way, so that you can take their learnings and apply them within your own startup or scale up and join the ever growing list of high growth UK SaaS businesses. Hi, and welcome back to the podcast. Today, I'm joined by Tom Dunlop, CEO of Surmise. Tom, great to have you here. Well, thanks for thanks for having me today. No worries at all. Really looking forward to the conversation. So, Surmise, first of all, tell us what is Surmise? What services, what platform do you provide? So, Surmise is essentially a digital contracting solution. Um, so, it's aimed at the kind of in house legal teams of corporates. And it kind of works across the whole contract lifecycle. So it kind of helps you create contracts, review contracts, and then manage them once they're signed. I see. Perfect. So yeah, I'm sure we'll get into some more detail exactly what that looks like. But what's your your background before Surmise? What led to the creation, the observation of those problems and challenges in the first place? Yeah, so I spent my, I got to know contracts very well um, when I was uh, a lawyer. So I guess it depends how far back you go. Um, But I kind of became a lawyer and moved in-house quite soon after I qualified. Um, So I tended to be an in-house lawyer for tech businesses who were kind of scaling up, going on their journey um, and ultimately aiming for an exit. And the the real use case, I guess, um, that that kind of was the the, the idea for Surmise was we were being bought by another company. So um, we had to go through the kind of due diligence um, and I manually reviewed about 500 contracts in that process. Um, And what probably a lot of people, yeah, it was a, it was a fun job. uh, As you can imagine the, uh, but the one thing, well, probably a lot of people don't realize um, is firstly in contracts, if you're a business, the business relationship, you know, you, you can't really get out of them. I mean, consumers are more protected. So that means that you literally have to read every single line of a contract just in case, you know, you miss anything in those scenarios. Yeah. And the second thing is that once you go through things like DocuSign, for example, they actually lock the, P- the PDF. So you can't even search them anymore because they're completely locked for security purposes. So I just found myself kind of realizing that this hugely manual task, when I knew what I was looking for, um, took me months really to do that as long as my day job. Um, whereas there was an obvious application of tech, working in a tech you know, tech company made me kind of uh, realize that as well, which is when I spoke to my uh, my kind of co-founder now and kind of worked through uh, how, you know, how we could devise a solution. Um, but I think the second part of what I realized when I was working in-house, um, obviously dealing with contracts was, was a big thing. But the other thing is you soon realize as a lawyer that you're kind of the last department to be digitized. You know, every every single department has their own solution. So sales had, you know, Salesforce, HubSpot, yeah. uh, marketing had their own tech, you know, the development team had their own tech, HR, finance, legal, we're just expected to have, you know, Word, email, things like that. So it was an obvious um, area that that needed uh, digitization, which is you know ultimately where we where we play today. Yeah, that makes a, a a lot of sense. I certainly can see what you mean by legal being you know later to digitize. I've not worked in legal departments, but I've worked with legal departments and, and certainly been exposed to you know data sharing practices and you know word documents being sent around that you know pretty dated practices that it felt like there should be better tooling for. Um, but one couple of things jumped out of me there when you were talking about some of the challenges you face when dealing with those contracts. It seems like there were really kind of two issues then. One kind of before you signed that contract, the issues around gaining knowledge, understanding what was in the contract, but then also after the fact, you know, making use of that information, you know, further down the line. Is that is that right? Yeah, I mean, we, we very much treat the system as, you know, pr- anything pre-signature. I think the aim of that is around, it's around efficiency, but it's actually more around, I guess, speeding up the business, either to revenue or to cash or just to a decision. So um, a lot of the tools that we deploy pre-signature um, are actually more for the business users. They're more for sales teams, for marketing teams, and to try and make them self-help a little bit more okay. um, with the idea that, you know, ultimately then they can get to revenue quicker, you know, 
So simple things, for example, um, NDAs or even the first draft of a services agreement, for example, um, it can kind of get lumped on legal and it can take days to turn around um, when they're relatively straightforward contracts, um, which is where we actually kind of uh, integrated into Teams and Slack and the Salesforce. And the idea behind that was that it's basically a chatbot that allows, that has a chat with the salesperson asking questions, depending on their answers, we can then draft the contract. Okay. So it's applying the legal knowledge, but it's essentially allowing the kind of business user to self-help, which became obviously a huge efficiency saving in the kind of pre-signature process. Yeah. I think for a post-signature process, which is quite interesting, um, given the, the kind of macro environment, so you've got, you know, certainly in the last number of years from the financial crisis through to GDPR coming in, and that meant that, you know, there was more data provisions than ever. Then we had, obviously, COVID, and then we had the war. Like, these kind of huge macro um, environmental things have, have actually influenced the board's, I guess, view on contracts. And then all of a sudden it became a really important thing to know is where, where are my contracts? What's in them? How do I get out of this contract? Or yeah. what are my obligations in terms of this particular supplier? So a lot of the post inch stuff that we do is is a, a lot of an understanding what's in your contracts, bringing it to the forefront, allowing you to get grips on that kind of really, really important data, um, which is obviously a different slant than that kind of pre-signature side. Sure. And what are the some of, some of the things that, you would then typically be looking out for in those contracts is it you know certain clauses that would be missing is it things that perhaps you know, don't work in your company's favor that you might not realize until further down the line what are that, some of those things it's a real mixture i mean i think we work with a you know range of clients across sectors so obviously every company has a slightly different angle but ultimately it usually revolves around a question that someone wants to know so a simple question might be you know how do i get out of a contract and that might be several different clauses that can answer that question. You know, what's the yeah. duration of the contract? What's the termination provision? So we try and position the system to answer those kind of questions. Similarly, it might be payment, you know, things like the triggers for payment. You know, payment terms is one thing, but it might be, well, is that payment on the date that you receive an invoice or is it payment on someone doing something in the future? Yeah. So when you actually dig down to what the business actually wants to know, uh, to, uh, the answers to these questions, it's an amalgamation of you know a number of different clauses. And then, but then if you try and group them together to answer these questions, that's the real power that we can bring to you know a lot of different businesses. Yeah, I, I see that makes a lot of sense. So, I guess in that legal department, then you know, having spotted some of those problems, noticing that yeah, legal was uh, a later department to digitize. How did you then? go about you know validating that you know, it, it was a widely held problem but also you had a solution that was viable as well yeah it's always um it's, it's a it's a great thing to be the client of your products and it's also potentially dangerous because you obviously mold it to your particular use case um so i think a lot of the early days was definitely you know my vision for what i had um always useful to me in my, my particular uh, use case. So yeah. one thing we realized quite soon was, you know, summarizing contracts, which is where we came from, was um, was obviously a very useful thing to do. But ultimately, that was because I'd just gone through that process. When I spoke yeah. to colleagues, you know, I had a network of lawyers and general counsels um, that I worked with or that I knew. Um, and we floated the products and they were like, yeah, that's great. You know, it looks, looks, looks really good. But, you know, I, I have... A contract management system over here and I don't really have a need to do a project right now um, so you soon start to realize that you've got to broaden it from your own perspective about what whatever the problem is that you specifically had yeah and then that's where the functionality starts to come from to really figure out where exactly in the market do you fit from a product perspective which you know also product market fit is so important when you're going through the the early days um, and that's something we tried to learn quite quickly probably because I understood the use case very well and I could kind of bounce it off my network um, but I think sometimes you've also got, you know, I had a vision of um, things like the Teams and Slack chatbots, for example, that no lawyer that I bounced off would ever have come to uh, suggest that as a, yeah. as a product functionality. So it really was a combination of leveraging my network, sense checking that the, the problem I was trying to solve existed, yeah. but then also combining that with a vision for how to solve that problem, which was myself, my co-founder, you know, CTO, and it was that balance between customer feedback, your own personal vision and making sure that you're balancing the two and not going really headstrong into one or the other. Yeah, I think that's really good insight that you have to have a balance of both of those things. You need both of those things. It's 
obviously extremely important, critical to validate the problem with customers, but the solution they might suggest is is going to be limited. It's going to be framed by their current experience and perspective, what they're used to using. And if you know, there hasn't been as much digital innovation, then they're probably not in a position to recognise what is possible or recognise what might be able to help them. Exactly. I mean, and that's where we looked at other tools, other departments. You know, we we knew and I knew working in a business that contracts weren't exclusive to legal. You know, they're a document that that ultimately records a commercial transaction. So really what you want to do is understand, you know, what is it that the, you know, the sales teams would want from the contract? What was their perfect experience? And so I would, you know, ask the sales teams I was working with and just say, you know, obviously forget how we work today. What what what's important to you? What would you want to see? You know, how would the process um, look like to you if you could design it? And it was overwhelmingly that they just wanted an element of control. Yeah. I think legal departments. What what we heard was it was almost like a black hole. You had, um, you know, you'd th- you'd kind of send something in, um, and they might have a system, they might have a product to do that. But ultimately, once it's in legal, no one knows what's happening, no one knows what they're doing, no one knows when they're going to get it back. Yeah. And I think that all that came out from speaking to the business users, whereas the legal team didn't really think about that. They were just kind of were, were focused on their own internal efficiency. Yeah, um, yeah. So you really have got to kind of look at the various different angles and, and keep coming back to the problem you're trying to solve, validating that. But the solution of how you solve it has really got to be a, a, a bit of a wider you know, discussion combined with your own your own vision as well. Yeah, absolutely. I can see how the legal team is obviously the primary department impacted by you know, your platform and, and other platforms but it's, it's definitely the wider business that get value from that as well so you certainly need to bring those parties into the conversation yeah definitely and when it came to the kind of early customer adoption then or, or even further down the line selling it to to new businesses because you know legal as you say has been later to kind of digitize so was that a difficult process to navigate or did you find them pretty you know open and receptive to new tooling improving ways of working it, it was definitely uh, a, a difficult sell um and i think we were selling to start with to both law firms and to legal teams um and one thing we we realized with law firms is you know most people will be aware they bill by the hour you know they're billing their time so they're monetizing their time not their knowledge in, in my view um, and so there's a, there's a huge conflict really. You're trying to sell them something which actually makes them a lot more efficient and actually requires them a lot of time to actually get it to be configured and set up to get those gains in the future. And so when we realized that law firms, they had no incentive, they, were no, they, were, they weren't incentivized to be more efficient because that would essentially mean that they're not building as much time. And also they weren't prepared to give the time up to actually implement the products, which is a, you know, it's, it's a known issue across the legal industry. Whereas in-house legal teams, um, you know, they're stretched. They have, they're a cost base. They're a cost center in a business. They have to be more efficient. That's the only thing they have is to try and get more efficient and scale because they're not going to get given headcount. So we learned that pretty quick in terms of how to sell between the two and which one resonated more with, um, with, with the two different sides. But I guess then since we've been to the US more recently and started to sell to the US, you then start to understand the difference between um, you know, a very evangelical sale to so someone where you've got to educate them. And that's what we found in the UK in particular, where the first few calls, demonstrations were an education process. It was kind of the why CLM, um, why do I need to be more efficient? What, what's even possible? What's the art of the possible? And then you've got to try and tackle budget timelines process. Whereas when we've gone to the US, what we found is that that might be their second generation purchase, or they may have already be on their third generation in some instances where we're finding now in the US. Um, and over there, it's less about, they know what a CLM is, they know the benefits, they've probably done a business case before. Um, but it, but it's huge actually to understand that when you're kind of selling to these markets, it's probably something we didn't appreciate when we first started out, that your entire sales pitch and sales process and how long will it take to close, and has got to really take those things into consideration to understand who is your customer and where are they on their buying journey? Because it's a very different sell that we have now between UK and US, for example. Yeah, that's really interesting. I can certainly see that how you need to be much more education based in a, a market that, like you say, the UK that's not got such wide exposure to the that way of working, I guess, before compared to the US. So, yeah, you're able to kind of shed any light on you know, some of the tangible differences then in terms of that that sales process? 
Yeah, I think the, I mean, with our typical sales process is very outbound driven. So, I mean, we have content marketing side of it, but realistically we have no, no global brand or something that, you know, people weren't searching for CLM in the UK, for example, coming back to the point, they weren't aware of the benefits. So we, we have this kind of model where we have SDRs as we call them, but basically ringing up trying to find um, leads and uh, on those calls, the first few questions are very sort of, um, I guess, soft education around the use case, more around, you know, for example, do you think your current contract process could be more efficient? Or, yeah. um, you know, if in a perfect world, do you think that if the business uses self, you know, being able to self-help would make you more efficient as a legal team or are you drowning in volume, that kind of thing? Yeah, yeah. And the, the reality is those questions, they're trying to get them to talk about the use case, the problem and really honing in on that. So then we can start to talk about solution from a high level about how it'll help them, not functionality. Yep. Whereas actually in the US, we're finding that we can just ring up a, you know, a, a general counsel, head of legal, and say, look, um, you know, look, you may already have a CLM. You should certainly be aware of a, a CLM. Why we're different is X. And we kind of immediately jump into the very functional difference between us and the the, uh, the competitors. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a different angle um, in terms of getting the retention because, you, you know, the same with content. For the UK, it's very educational. It's very high level, very about the kind of use cases and the problems, whereas the, the US is very much functionality-based. Um, and more around you know, why we're different to competitors compared to um, just overarching kind of use case. Yeah, that's that's fascinating. I think obviously the positioning that you have is is got to be clearly very very different between those two markets, and something I think a lot of people might not appreciate. They might think, oh, we need to work on our positioning. We've got it right. It's nailed, and then that's suitable for all markets, which is often not the case at all. So. Yeah, when it came to the US, then how how did you find that have process, or what do you see your key differentiators being? What is that different position that you you try and hold there? So I guess our, our differentiators kind of come back to that teams and Slack um, and Salesforce positioning. So pretty much all of the other tech vendors in in our space created this kind of all in one platform, kind of like a think like Salesforce but for contracts. So yeah. you kind of have to everyone has to go and work in their platform. They've developed their own version of Microsoft Word, for example. Um, and they might send out notifications. So they call them integrations, but you know, like uh, someone's made a comment, click this link, it'll take you back into the, sure. the product. Um, what we decided to do, partly because we were founded in COVID and we realized that this mass adoption of, you know, Office 365, Teams, Slack, um, is we just plugged our intelligence into those tools. So the big differentiator for us is definitely around, you know, the UI that someone would actually be working in is something they're familiar with. Yeah. And when we go to the US, for example, um, the challenge they probably had in rolling out an existing tool because they're on that second generation purchase is... Uh, implementation is it's how do I get my sales team to use this product? And they've experienced the pain of that at that point, whereas the UK haven't. Oh, I see. So what we found, these are obviously over generalizations, there's exceptions, but um, so when we went with the kind of Teams and Slack angle and we said, look, you've probably had issues with trying to get your sales team adopting this solution because it's something entirely different. Yep. Why we're different is we can get them to create a contract in Slack and that's how they probably communicate with you today. Is that right? And you kind of get them to really bite at that sort of angle compared to, um, I guess, uh, something they haven't experienced yet, which is hard to educate them over a problem they don't have. Yeah, that's very, very different, isn't it? That virtues of contract management in the first place versus and here's how, we, how you actually get engagement from the salespeople and the other departments in your business and actually get the promised you know, advantages and return on investment. Yeah, and and we and we found that as well. It's it's difficult. It's it's more difficult in the UK market because um, when they see the all-in-one solutions, in our view, like they they demonstrate the demonstration is really good because it's all hell. It's all their real estate. So it's all connected. Sure. It's all um, you know. It's, it looks very very good and very cool. And then I think when you um, and so you've experienced the pain of how you actually go about implementing that. Like most systems, HR systems are probably quite similar. Where you know, we had one a while ago where the only interaction I had was approving holidays by email. Yeah. So it really didn't matter what the UI was like in the products. I never even saw it. I just hit an email approve and that was my interaction yep. with the product. So I think it's kind of really thinking about that as a experience was what we, um, you know, so I understand that now. So I understand we've moved systems since because I've understood that what's important in that kind of solution. And we've actually ironically gone with a solution that has a Teams and Slack chatbot which is what we've done in the uh, legal sector yeah that's really interesting and i can see that 
you know, for a lot of founders, when they set out to create something, they've got a vision of what the platform could look like. I can imagine that they, you know, envisage people logging into their system, you know, using it day in, day out, getting to experience this thing that you've created and put in front of them. But actually, the most seamless thing, the least unobtrusive thing could well be just better quality integration with their existing tool set that actually genuinely enables them to do the work they're trying to do in the in the system they're already in yeah it's 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 a very big difference um and i think that's it, again it depends on the i think a lot of people spend a lot of time on the ui and we have as well we've got you know a, a huge amount of time we've spent on how the user experience like hangs together and the interface looks um but ultimately you do soon realize that well all that's irrelevant if you can't actually get the users to to go to the platform on and what's the compelling reason to do that why would they do that yeah. in their day-to-day life so i think there's a there's a lot more considerations than just what what you think it looks and feels like the implementation rollout is is equally as important, particularly in SaaS, because you have to get recurring revenue. So you have to keep selling it basically every year, every year, every year, and proving that value. Uh, absolutely. And if you look at metrics that a lot of people track around your know, daily active users, etc., it could well be that an active user hasn't actually used the the web based part of your platform, but is you know just using a Slack or a Teams you know portion of the integration. I guess you've got to measure that stuff a bit differently then. Yeah, you do. And we, we have different, I mean, the metrics we measure are different per use case. So you know, yeah. particularly if we're looking at, you know, one one client, for example, uh, just uses the Slack chatbot for NDAs for um, kind of their commercial team. Now, for us, that's quite a narrow use case, but they've they've saved probably... I think they're up to about 500 NDAs created in the last, I don't know, six, seven months, well, um, yeah. completely on their own by, by sales teams. And then when you think, well, even if an NDA takes, I don't know, 20 minutes to put together, when you times it by 500 and you, you know, then you, so how long a, a lawyer would take to do that? Um, for them, that's huge ROI and a very narrow use case. So, you know, for us, that's great. Obviously, if they're using the full end-to-end CLM, that's even better. But that, that, that we, we're able to, um, I guess, measure success in different ways depending on the use case that the people have. Yeah, yeah. And are there legal teams in those companies accepting of that? Or, you know, I can imagine there could be some cases where they're a bit fearful of that. And you think, well, they can't do it as well as, I can, or how much more are they going to try and take away from from my workload? How have you you found that kind of pushback? Uh, I, to, to be honest, I think you get a few, but probably more in the junior end. I think the reality is when you're a lawyer, um, you know, you go through law school, you go through a law degree than law school. I think the biggest surprise actually when you become a lawyer is how manual and admin heavy your job becomes. Right. Not one lawyer wants to be sat there creating NDAs. There's, or if you do, then you you know. You, you probably uh, wasted a lot of time in law school to be able to just do that for yeah, yeah. Um, you know for your day job. So it's very rare that people look at this and think it's going to take my job. It's going to you know because they want to be doing more exciting stuff, but they can't because they're bogged down. Now that was the difference though between in-house legal and private practice uh, law firms. Is law firms are actually thinking, well, all I care about is monetizing my time. Yeah. I really don't care whether it's doing some admin tasks, whether it's printing, whether it's, you know, doing a complex litigation, like as long as we're getting our billables, we don't care. And I think that is changing slightly, but we certainly found that that that's obviously not a particularly uh, great way for us to sell into that if that is the mentality that's been adopted in in a firm. Yeah, absolutely. It sounds like they're definitely not optimized to delivering value and certainly not delivering value as efficiently as possible, as I can see with those in-house teams, yeah, it's taking that more mundane stuff off their plate so they can actually use more of their expert knowledge and experience. Definitely. Yeah, no, that's that's really interesting. So in terms of surmise then and the the kind of the the journey into deploying that, you know, in the UK and then going to the US as well, you know, how has that journey been going from you know working in a legal team to to founding and running a company in that space? Um, I guess different aspects of that. So I guess for me personally, um, I mean, I've loved every minute of it. I think it's, um, you know, my 
my mentality, I, 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 my, the things I struggled with being a lawyer was you always had to be the voice of risk in every conversation. And you were, you were very rarely allowed to be the kind of creative one and the one to come up with solutions, basically. You'd yeah. come up with the problems and you'd, you'd highlight the problems. Um, and then there was other people that came up with solutions. So for me, this is uh, like a huge um, kind of creative release almost to be able to actually create solutions to problems and not just think about what could go wrong um, all yeah. the time. Um, but then in terms of the journey itself, I mean, one thing that I found is that the, the, the stage on the journey that you're at is massively important. I think when you go through this journey, you obviously look for people with, you know, who give you advice and, and try and give you pointers. And there's so much conflicting advice, but I think that part of that is because um, it's only relevant for a particular part of your stage. When you're trying to sell sure. to the first 10 customers, I mean, you like I, I like the old adage of, you know, you do things that don't scale. Like I would be ringing people, I'd be doing the demonstration, uh, they signed up, I'd do the contract, then I would onboard them and I was probably acting as their customer success as well. And it's kind of like, obviously that's not going to scale. So yeah. every person who would give you advice would essentially say that, you know, you're bonkers to do that, you need to do this, you need to do this. And, and I think, well, well, no, actually right now, this is what we have to do. And then, you know, getting your first few customers to a hundred grand of revenue, for example, um, is a slightly different problem than a hundred to a million and then million to 10 million. You kind of, you're always in a different stage and there's always slightly different things that you should be doing. And that's one of the things that I've learned that probably isn't as clear actually when you start this journey that you really need to treat your priorities and how the business functions and what is scalable, what isn't, and depending on where you are on that, on that journey. Yeah, absolutely. I know certainly many. Really- conferences you see people kind of lapping up talks by these big companies that oh how we got to a a billion dollar valuation from zero to 200 million dollars in revenue with a product-led growth strategy and then you see all these really super early stage people you know kind of feverly taking kind of notes and you know trying to work out how they can apply that same strategy but you know they are looking at a strategy that's like four or five steps if not more ahead of where they are so it's not going to be appropriate they're not going to see the results there they're looking for but how do you then take all of that information and different advice out there how were there any kind of useful resources or tools or ways of thinking that allowed you to actually distill that a bit and find out what was the right thing for that particular stage i mean it's very hard i think i think this is why it's very dangerous to give kind of like a specific advice to, to other companies almost in different positions. But there was a great book that I read called Impossible to Inevitable. Um, it's by Jason Lemkin, who uh, is kind of just a saster and he was at Salesforce early on. But, but that is all about the first 10 customers, the focus on getting to your first 10 customers that are at arm's length. And it's a really good book to to just get going and then it talks about how you get from 10 to maybe 50 and then maybe to uh be on there so that in the initial early early stages that book was great and I, I kind of read that like the bible really about how we actually started yeah i think then going forward <clears throat> um we were fortunate that i managed to get a really good angel investor who was actually the founder of the business that i used to be the general counsel at so okay um when i was doing that due diligence where we had to review those contracts for the sale that was for his company essentially so he exited from that business um and that's been hugely uh, important as well because if you've got not only an angel investor um who can obviously provide funding but also someone who has been through those stages themselves and even though they might not particularly resonate with where you're at right now it might have been they can't quite remember the challenges that they had yeah um th- there's always things in there about well maybe the next stage you need to get to this so then you work back from that and start to think about what should you do from now to get to that next phase so it's definitely about getting those good, you know, advisors um, who've been there and done it. You know, I think it's easy to get a big name advisor who's worked in a big corporate, but the reality is their advice is probably completely irrelevant when you're at the early stage because they just don't know. I mean, if you worked for, I don't know, Visa, um, yeah, you, you're not going to know how Visa started. You weren't there at the beginning, so you have no idea um, what we should be doing right now, which sounds you know, bad, but it, but it is, that's how you cut the noise out is you've got to really focus on someone who's actually been uh, at the phase you're at before. Absolutely. And in terms of the, the metrics, the measures of success then at those different stages, you know, how have, how have those changed as Mike has been able to, you know, grow and expand? And well, I think I'd say the early days, again, 
get into your first hundred grand of revenue, for example. I mean, there is no metrics. You just you yeah. just, like you've got to do everything you can just to get people to resonate with the problem and then pay you money for the solution. I mean, we didn't. We had a list price for the cost, which we just thought, based on market research, is right. Um, we heavily discounted, and you just do anything you can just to get people to use your products and get that feedback. And then, I think from you know, they talk about stages from 100K to about a million was where we found, which is common for product market fit. That was when we really started to think, well, how how can the products be scalable and how can the products repeatedly answer this very particular use case? And also, are we targeting the right section of the market? You know, are we targeting yeah. companies with 50,000 employees? Are we targeting, you know, companies with 200 employees or somewhere in between? And I think that it's really important at that stage to really work out not necessarily your go-to-market funnel metrics at that point. I still think that's a little bit early, but at that point it was all about um, can we repeatedly sell this product and solve a solution for this section of customers? Yeah. And then post the million, um, what we started to turn our attention to was more around the go-to-market funnel metrics essentially about how can we make the sales process the marketing process more repeatable and that's where now we're in a you know a fortunate position where we well we believe where we can kind of work out how many literally dials or calls it will take to get a, a deal or you know a particular marketing activity and how much the cost will come in and then how many sales accepted leads for example it will create um, and it really starts to get quite scientific um so then you can you know hence why we're uh, like the, the language of the scale up rather than the startup is that yeah. you really can then get into a, a scale up position and very repeatable. And so our metrics now very funnel focused, very, you know, top of the funnel in terms of um, both, you know, dials to, to attended meetings through the marketing side to, you know, form fills and, and sales accepted leads. And then three down to revenue. And we, we, we monitor that with a, um, you know, practically daily really. Um, as well as obviously product uses metrics and, and and kind of understand on the CS side. But that's been a huge kind of switch for us over the past uh, probably six to nine months. Yeah, no, I think that's really interesting. So thank you for sharing that because I think a lot of people perhaps think that those different stages or metrics or processes come in earlier than they actually do. Like I agree that outbound can be absolutely fantastic you can own that process you can control that process you can get to the stage that you're at where you know it does become that scientific approach but it it can take a while to get that right and there's a lot of factors in there right it's the messaging it's the market there's so many different elements that i think for some people they can try and get that in too early when they're not really mature enough not really got the right market understanding or product maturity to to make that work yeah, so I mean, I, I totally agree. I think it's um, for me, it's all about what milestone are you aiming towards. You know, we closed Series A, you know, back end of last year. Um, so I think for us now, uh, kind of, we have this mission, which is that we're on the sort of one to ten ARR sort of is what I call as our kind of kind of typical scale up phase. Yeah. Um, and within that phase, you know, there's certain things you want to get to, but one of them is actually then the the kind of cash generative profitability, which is obviously very topical at the minute with tech businesses. Um, and that's where, you know, certain metrics around, you know, revenue per employee or obviously gross margin, you know, the, the kind of cost of acquisition, all these kind of stats, which um, may be absolutely core to a big business and almost like, why would you not be tracking them earlier? And we are tracking them, but the same yeah. time, in terms of how we're doing or are we achieving what we set out to, they weren't the important metrics in terms of a milestone earlier. Um, whereas now we're looking at it. I think there's things like uh, we used to uh, look at like the CAC payback, which in SaaS is, you know, the cost of acquisition and then how quick can you pay it back with a customer? Sure. And I think like, I do think we got carried away with some of these metrics in the really early days and you start to measure that and you're like, it's completely pointless. That's not the metric you should be focusing on. It should be whatever milestone it might be, which might be a number of customers. It might yeah. be a, an adoption rate. It might be a, a particular ARR target, for example, but it certainly shouldn't be the real efficiency metrics that you need to get when you're a, a you know, 50 million ARR business. Um, so it's very yeah, different. Yeah. And it sounds like then to get that level of focus which you know certainly sounds like it's been really really important to your success how do you get alignment on those objectives especially when you've got investors coming on board as well how do you make sure that you know that milestone that vision that goal that you've got internally is 
you know, a wi- widely held belief and, and you are genuinely all aligned to that. I think, well, I think there's there's two different sides. There's probably the board dynamic and then there's probably the, the, the actual internal employee dynamic. I think, again, coming back to the angel investor side, what, what I think we've always been quite lucky with is having really strong, you know, neither non-execs or angels or chairmen, whatever it might be, that um, they get it. You know, they get the, that that's not important right now. And they get that, um, you know, so when... You know, I think some of the challenges with some of the investment firms, um, and this isn't, this, again, it's a generalist statement, but is that they will be looking at the metrics that, you know, maybe they need to report on. You yeah. know, so that might include efficiency metrics or profitability or, or, or you know, whatever it might be. Um, but I think that's where you as a business have really got to set out, well, actually right now, this isn't, this isn't the core metric we should be measuring ourselves on. Is actually these three things. And the milestone we're aiming to get to is, you know, at this point in time, we want to be here. And when you've got a strong angel investor or non-exec who's backing that up, that really yeah. helps with the board dynamic. I think internally, I mean, it's again, it's just been it's been transparent, but it's having you know we run a few different things internally about how we get people bought in. I think we have an overarching mission and uh, or vision about what we're trying to do, and I think people buy into that. But I think we then set. Um, so we have the kind of overarching vision. We have a mission which is usually not necessarily for that particular financial year. That's like for right now, our mission is the 10 million ARR. Yeah. That's our mission that we're currently on. And then we work back from that and have you know financial year objectives which are broken down. And then everyone, obviously typical OKRs where every individual person understands what they're doing is contributing to those objectives. So we have quite catchy uh, ways of remembering them like our... Um, our uh, kind of well our values are grow so that kind of growth mindset respects others one team will to win so we have this kind of grow um acronym for our values and then for our objectives yeah. we split them into kind of an a b c d so again people can really understand um what what each of them are they understand them they get them they can all recite them and they also know how they personally can contribute to them so i think it's a it is it's making those two different things from board dynamics through to actually getting the company to not only buy into them but actually remember them i think is quite quite important yeah absolutely it's really demonstrated that you do live by them you are measuring against them versus you know something a bit more aspirational or or just a bit more shallow to be perfectly honest that some companies have in terms of you know what the objective of the day is almost yeah and i think i mean i worked in a previous company where they approached it from, you know, some people have a very, very big goal in the future and it's a very, um, it's quite a daunting goal, but maybe there's a huge reward if we get there. So it's, you know, if we reach X, we will give everyone a huge bonus or a trip somewhere or, you know, whatever it might yeah. be. Um, but a lot, a lot of times I found that they can be massively demotivational because it's so far in the future. And then the slight deviation from the plan, you think you're never going to get there. So, a big part of our, you know, the, the growth mindset, one of our values, so all about 1% improvements. We have the vision and we have, you know, the, the FY objectives and the mission. So people can kind of see where we're going in the near term. Yeah. But they also don't necessarily even focus on that. They're looking at every 1% improvement at a time. And I think it's overused now into the marginal gains, 1% improvements. But um, we do a few different things to, to try and make it live. We have a kind of 1% board that people put 1% suggestions on. And then... Um, we award every month a 1% award. 1% of someone's salary is basically paid to the best 1% suggestion. Okay. Um, so there's a bit of a monetary gain there, but actually what we're really doing is uh, getting everyone in the mindset of just thinking about what they're doing and can it be improved. And that's been a real a real game changer for the culture internally as well about how we everyone's bought in. Yeah, no, I can see that. I can see how that's certainly a lot more tangible. It must feel a lot more achievable and therefore motivating and engaging to achieve that versus oh we're going to be a billion dollar company I thought well that'll be nice but how are we going to get there yeah and a lot of people the biggest thing I've found with um with with employees and this is true of most generations but I think particularly now where they, they do want to know that you have a vision or a purpose or somewhere where you're aiming to go. Yeah. But probably the biggest thing that people want is just, a, you know, they want to feel like they're contributing. They want actually genuine, um, like n- not ownership as in necessarily the, the, the company or that, that helps. Um, 
but ownership in terms of tasks and knowing that they are contributing to it. And so yeah. again, the one thing we found with 1% was actually it enables people to suggest something and they see that their suggestion has actually been implemented and it's improving the business. So there's real ownership of, oh, I can contribute actually to where we're going. Not just that the company is going to reach a billion dollars. You've actually got to care about how the individual fits into that picture and can they contribute to help get there, which is much more rewarding. So we've we've seen a huge um, kind of engagement with certainly that particular value um, since we introduced it. Yeah, no, that's a lot more empowering, as you say, isn't it? It's yeah, something employees can really take on and you know adopt and see the difference that they make, and therefore you know feel part of something i can imagine yeah no they, they, they definitely do um and i think it's you know we, we we try and do a lot on personal development on training on learning on you know and, and alongside and really make it about the employee's journey as well as the company's journey i think yeah. a lot of companies and ceos and you know i've probably guilty of this as well to start with where you talk so much about this kind of entity this thing which is the company and how, what it is going to do yeah and i think unless you can make it personal to someone and how that impacts them and where do they fit um they're probably not going to get that engagement um so one thing we did quite early on actually was um we did the surmise of the future it's a massive org chart of a company with you know let's say 150 200 people in yeah and we put a load of roles in there that would typically exist and then we got everyone to really go on that org chart and say you know this is the position i want to be in you know and it's not it's so far in the future you've got fifty thousand employees we're talking about you know say 200 person business yeah um and we were trying to get everyone to visual. Well, how, how you know how are you going to get there then what do you need to do to be that position in surmise in you know two years or whatever it might be sure um, and that was quite powerful to really kind of get the individuals bought into the journey as well as what we were talking about the journey was going to be like for the company. Yeah, yeah, it kind of breaks the big vision down, the company vision down into the people vision, doesn't it? Yeah, exactly. It's it's, it's really empowering. Yeah, no, that's really, really interesting. So, no, thank you for sharing that. I think that's going to be really, really interesting to anyone listening to this. But, you know, just before we do wrap things up, is there any uh, advice you would give other founders, you know, potentially first-time founders as they navigate that journey from startup to scale-up? I, I think it's recapping some of the things we've covered. So I guess things I would, uh, well, I guess popular bits of advice that I think are worth not ignoring, but placing less emphasis on. Yeah. And um, one is that raising money from friends and family first is a great idea. I think um, for me, having a strong angel investor who'd been through the journey before was you know, so much more valuable for the onward journey than trying to go to friends, family. And also it can, it can really affect personal relationships if you don't quite scale or don't quite make it. And in particular yeah. those early days, it, it might just place added pressure, which you don't need at that time. So I'm not sure that's a particularly good one. I think in terms of the product side of it as well, it's coming back to what we said before, like listen to customers in terms of the problem they're facing, but don't necessarily listen to customers in terms of the solution they come up with. So there's a couple of things that I think a lot of people get told this when they're in the early stage, but I wouldn't place as much emphasis. And then I think in terms of things to be aware of, um, one is that kind of be aware of the stage you're in, do things that don't scale. Like, like there's no harm in, you know, the founder being uh, the salesperson, the the CS person, the, you know, even prospects in doing phone calls. Like I get that it doesn't scale, but actually, particularly in the early days, it doesn't matter about metrics. Just, just you've just got to prove out that concept as quick as you can, and do anything you can to to, to get there. Um, so yeah, just just reiterating those. I think um, I wouldn't wouldn't complicate it with any of my own bits of wisdom that would get lost in the rest of the noise. No, absolutely. I think that's great advice, and I think yeah, the way you've shared this my journey definitely illustrates the value of those as well. So no, thank you, Tom, for for sharing that and. Obviously, wish you the best of luck with Surmise. We'll leave links to Surmise in the description for anyone who wants to check it out with them. Says whether you're at a startup stage or scale up. You know, if this has resonated at all, if you want to find out more about the platform, about contract management as well, then I encourage you to check the site out. But Tom, thank you very much for for sharing that, and thank you for the time today. No problem. Thank you for having me. Thank you for joining me on this episode of Inside the Scale Up. Remember, for the show notes and in-depth resources from today's guest, you can find these on the website insidethescaleup.com. You can also leave feedback on today's episode, as well as suggest guests and companies you'd like to hear from. 
Thank you for listening.